I'm very proud of this interview because we beat MSNBC and NBC to it. <laughs> but also very proud to be here and have to do amazing work in the last 35 years and really proud to be here in the community. Uh, I admire you so much. I admire your show. Thank you so much. And really, really proud to be here with you. Um, this is a big question up front. And uh, your book talks about getting right into it, cutting the BS, just going right to it as you do in your interviews. I can ask you why you wrote a book about the baby. The first line says it. You say, what would you do if tens of thousands of lives depended on you winning an argument? How important is it to have a meaningful debate, especially in this moment? It's a great question. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you so much for stepping in. I feel proud of you. You have to read my book in the space of about 36 hours. I don't have receipts, but you know me great, that yeah. Was, uh, that was a, a prize for lunch. Um, so I'm to all of you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm actually breaking one of my own public speaking rules. I'm doing an event where Muslim people are eating, which goes against all of them. So uh, good luck to us keeping that engaged while they have French fries. So lovely evening. Uh, good luck to us. It'll be a real test for you. Um, when I wrote this book, a lot of people said, it's good for you, it's good for other people. And I'm like, oh, you know, it's not for everyone. You like it, but I'm not that person. And the point of the book is to say, we are all that person at some stage in our life. Right? There is no point in anyone's life where you don't have to win an argument, uh, make your case, convince or persuade someone. Every, every man, woman, or child on planet Earth at some point has tried to convince someone that they are right, that they are, that they should be believed or listened to. And I start the book with a story from ancient Greece, which you read out, which is the uh, Mytilenean Revolt, which is very briefly, uh, ancient Greece, two empires, Sparta and Athens, are at war with each other. Uh, the, uh, the Athenians capture a small island uh, of Mytilene, and they decide to execute everyone there as a deterrent against revolt. And the story I tell in the book is a very famous debate where, uh, back in Athens, because Athens loved to debate in that great debating assembly, um, the Athenian assembly decides, should we execute them or should we not execute them? And they decide to debate it. And they have one guy with a very cruel, angry general who makes things to kill all the men and slave all the women as a deterrent. And they have another guy whose job is to make the case for mercy and clemency. And so the book begins by me saying, what if you were that guy? What if you had the pressure with limited time, because they're about to execute everyone, and you have to convince everyone not to kill like 10,000 people? And I, I, I do that to set the stakes to make the point that some arguments are really, really important. Some are not. Some are with your sibling, with your spouse, or whatever it is. Um, but the tools <coughs> you need are the same. Uh, and that's how I kind of set up the book. And it's interesting you should ask me that question today, because I'm sure we're at an impact event in LA. And I would guess a lot of people here have been arguing about what's been going on in the Middle East and trying to make their case to people, whether it's elected officials, whether it's people in the media. And again, that is an argument I think many people would argue is a really, really important argument to win. Because as we speak, a lot of people, innocent people are dying across that region. So again, having these skills can be important for you whether you're going for a job interview, or they can be important for you if you're advocating for thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, tens of thousands of miles away. Okay, I'm going to push you a little bit on this. I'm going to pull up. Maybe you have something, maybe you have something, that's okay. You talk about how everyone uh, at one point argues, right? At this moment, how important it is to make your voice heard. Is that the point, though? You, know, you hear people say it is about consensus. It's about coming together. We live in a moment where people are getting doxxed. Cancel, where it's hard to speak up where you could lose your job. Is it really always about debating and arguing? Or is there a push and a need to come together and come in the ground? So I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think the reason I wrote the book is because argument gets a bad rap. It's blamed for everything. It's blamed for political polarization. It's blamed for marital breakdowns. It's blamed for everything in our society. And people, I think people, a lot of people, they kind of move away from it and say, oh, that's bad. And I try and say in the book, actually, good faith argument. It's a very crucial distinction between good faith and bad faith argument, right? There are people out there who are not really interested in debating on it. There's some people I want to have on my show, but I say very clearly in the book, I've said many interviews. Like, I love to argue. Anyone who knows me, like a family in the audience knows I love to argue. Not, I'm not just talking about arguing with, like, a politician on air. You know, I'm, I'm talking about arguing, like, over a board game, over the score. Like, I'll argue, I'll argue everything. But there are certain arguments I won't have. So there's, for example, I wouldn't have a climate denial on my show. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a hot denial on my show. I'm not going to argue up is down, black is white, hot is cold. That's pointless. I'm not going to argue reality. So certain arguments are not going to happen. 
And in that sense, yes, we should avoid them. But in general, in a democracy, the only way to save democracy is to be able to provide forums for good faith debate, disagreement, because groupthink is the worst thing possible. Some of the worst things that have happened in our society, uh, including, for example, the financial crisis or the Iraq war, uh, were the products of groupthink, of not enough dissent, not enough people to be able to give counter arguments. So I'm trying to say in the book, let's create the spaces. Right now, our politics and our media, parts of our media, have been taken over by grifters, gaslighters, con men, serial liars. We can't allow them to take it over. So in the book I'm saying everyone else needs to equip themselves with the rhetorical skills to be able to push back against the bad faith actors and make space for good faith actors to have genuine good faith disagreements where we don't have to hit each other or kill each other at the end of them. We can actually walk away maybe having learned something. Okay, so let's talk about also about leadership. And we hear this a lot, especially on MSNBC, the fact that Democrats come armed with facts and facts, and they lose. At the same time, you've highlighted and others, the people on the right operate a lot of times with emotion. That often leads to alternative truths. What is the balance between these two things? It's a great question. The balance is very important. But if you look at the way I structure the book, the chapter on feelings comes before the chapter on facts. One of the great myths when it comes to debate, argument, public speaking, politics in general, is that if you have enough facts, if the facts are on your side, then you'll win. That is not true. In fact, that rarely ever happens. And that, the example I always give is the 2016 presidential election. You have a politician on one side who is a former Secretary of State, former Senator, who knows everything about everything. Like Hillary Clinton had a 16-point childcare plan. Who remembers what it was? I'm sure it was a great childcare plan. Donald Trump said, build a wall, ban Muslims. Everyone remembers that. Lock her up. Like, short, pithy, emotive phrases that got people worked up. The Republicans, especially in the Trump era, have become the masters of, of dark emotions, right? They appeal to our dark side. Anger, fear, paranoia, suspicion of the other. Um, and it works, because human beings, we respond, all the studies show, and I cite some of the studies in the book, that show that we don't actually reason our way towards our conclusions or our beliefs. We think we do. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of, it's a bias, it's a cognitive bias that we have, that we think that we have dispassionately weighed all the evidence and then made a decision or cast a vote. Actually, we don't. We tend to feel our way towards conclusions, sometimes unwittingly, unconsciously. And so I say in the book, the key to winning any argument or persuading any crowd is not just to appeal to their head, but to appeal to their heart. And for too often, liberals, leftists, even people in academia, look at the COVID debate, right? Look at how the COVID debate was lost on vaccines, on masking, because people, liberals and uh, leftists, and people in, 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 in the bureaucracy, go, the argument always is just one more study. If I give you one more statistic, one more peer-reviewed paper, I will win you over. And the other side's like, no, you're all going to die. And it's, you know, it's not a fair fight when you're not on that level playing. But so what I say in the book is, look, if you can have all the facts in the world, if you can't appeal to people's hearts as well as their heads, you will lose. That doesn't mean you jump the facts to go back to your question about balance. I'm not saying we all turn into mini Trumps and just play to people's worst emotions. Obviously, you should have an emotional argument that is backed up with actual facts and figures because... I mean, people think facts don't matter anymore. We live in an age where Kellyanne Conway says alternative facts and Rudy Giuliani says, you know, the truth is not the truth. No, they still matter. People can still be persuaded by evidence-based reasoning, but it's how you package and present it to people. And what I'm saying is, if you're giving a speech, if you're engaging with someone, don't just start with, well, I have a statistic for you. No, please start with some form of uh, opening line, opening gambit that allows you to connect with that person, that finds some common ground with that person, that gets that person roused up and paying attention. So you say it's not about junk facts. We all know that. And in your book, you say the first, the chapter about emotions comes before the chapter about facts. So I got to ask you about Hassan Minaj and emotional truths, because we know that there's a, there's a controversy about that. And a lot of people, especially a room full of many Muslims talking about that, right? Where does fact and emotion intersect? What are your thoughts on that controversy? That's a good question. Um, so declare an interest. My Has husband thought of it. So that's a good question. Um, so let me declare an interest. I know Hassan. Hassan's a friend of mine. When I read that New Yorker piece, I was very disappointed. I was kind of like, this is bad. 
And I saw a lot of Muslims say, it's a hit job against a Muslim guy. And I said, come on, guys. You can't just say everything's a hit job. The evidence is there. The facts are there. But of course, facts can be selective. And I don't know how many of you have watched Hassan's video that he did uh, recently. Um, Let's see a raise of hands. How many people watched it? Okay. I think Hassan did a very good job of making his case, both on an emotional level, where he appeals to you personally and reminds you who he is, that he's not a, a psychopath, I think is what he said at the start, and in terms of laying out the receipts. My chapter on facts is bring your receipts. That's the title of the chapter, with great respect to the late, great Whitney Houston. Right? You have to have receipts. And he brings receipts in that. Hassan taped his interviews with The New Yorker. Hassan kept his emails with the girl who said he, would, you know, he doxed her. And I think when I watched the video, I thought, wow, The New Yorker, which is one of the great mainstream respected media outlets in America, which is famous for its fact checking. Personally, I think The New Yorker now has questions to answer. And I think when Hassan put his video out, their response was a very weak, we stand by our story, but they didn't engage with the many, many receipts he brought. And now, from where I'm sitting, and I'm, I'm happy to hear the New Yorker's side of it, if they bother to engage, it actually does look like a hit job on Hassan Minhaj. And now he's not going to get The Daily Show because of that. But you know what? Add that to the long list of Muslims in public life who are getting hit right now. Um, I think we made news, by the way, because I did a few Google searches. I don't think you've commented on Hassan Minhaj publicly no. before. Um, by the way, your, your comment about Whitney Houston, if you guys haven't listened to Mehdi's audiobook, you really should, because you come with receipts. I, you have old audio of Whitney Houston talking about receipts and a lot of your other interviews, and it's a fantastic listen in addition to a fantastic read. Um, you, you talk about how Muslims often are, bear the brunt of a lot of scenarios, right? We're in a room full of many Muslims. I know I sometimes worry as a Muslim American that I might come across as aggressive when having a debate. Your entire book is about argument, uh, ar arguing, debating. Do you find this yourself? How do you walk that line? Do I worry about coming across as aggressive is the great question of my life. It's the question my wife, my children, my mother, my cousins, my father, everyone I know. Uh, I was at dinner last night and someone took a picture of me talking to my cousin and I look like I'm about to kill him, right? So I, ha I say in the book, I have what I call RAMF. I have resting angry Muslim face, which means, which, me which is really problematic because I discovered early on in my TV career that when I'm interviewing a guest, when I'm asking the questions and the guest is speaking and the camera cuts to me, I'm like, mmm. <laughs> And that's my listening, reflecting, thinking face, but producers will say in my ear, you look like you're about to kill the guest. And then I realized over the years, I had to kind of, kind of do the fake smiles and, mm, and look at the halves. And it's really hard balance to strike. And yes, look, anyone, look, all minority communities, they're not just minority communities, it's not just Muslims, black people deal with the same problem, right? There are a lot of tropes about black men, black women, which we're seeing with the vice president. There are a lot of tropes about how women in general come across. I mean, let's go back to Hillary Clinton in 2016. Do you remember the debate where there was like, she should smile more, right? There's, a, there's that trope has been around for a long time in relation to various groups who are not white men. Right? And Muslims, of course, in the era of terrorism, yes, there is a big trope about, just as there is about the angry black man, there is the angry Muslim who wants to kind of blow you up. So that is a problem. Now, obviously, it's not fair. But what I say in the book is, like, nothing about arguing is fair. So what I say in the book is, you have to deal with it. There's no point just pretending it doesn't exist. There's no point just denying it. You have to live in the world as it is, not as the world as you want it to be. And therefore, what I've had to do, and you know, each to their own, but what I've had to do is try and think around that. Like, if I'm in front of a non... So I, I give an example in the book where uh, many years ago, I was on a BBC panel discussion in a rural part of England. And I walked out, and it was a huge crowd, like 200 people. It was in a small elementary school in a village. Everyone in the audience was white and over the age of 60. And me and a guy from the Labour Party was in England. Uh, he was a black politician. He's now the Shadow Foreign Secretary, David Lammy. And I turned to him and I said, I think you and I are the only people in this room, I whispered, who are non-white and under the age of 40 in this room. And obviously, me, and the first question that night was about a guy called Abu Qatada, who was called bin Laden's ambassador to Europe. He was detained by the British government post 9-11. And there was a debate about deporting him to Jordan. Should he or should he not be deported to Jordan? And the argument was he shouldn't because he'd be tortured there. The British government shouldn't torture, uh, deport him. That was a debate. And they came to me first. And I'm like, I'm in a room full of elderly, white, small C conservative people. I'm the brown Muslim guy. And the first question is about a terror suspect. 
Right? How do I win this crowd over? They're already going to come with certain unwitting prejudices, whether they like it or not, unconscious biases. And the first thing I did was to go out of my way not to quote, not to say anything about foreign policy, war on terror, even, you know, international law, all stuff that this crowd doesn't want to hear about. What I did was I talked about the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta is 121580. It's Britain's first constitution. It is what everyone in Britain loves, right? It's, 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 you know, it's the closest thing we have to a constitution in the UK. And it's kind of thing you learn about in school. So I just went on and on about how much I love the Magna Carta. And don't we all love the Magna Carta? And didn't we sit in a school like this and learn about the Magna Carta? What happened to glorious British history? And everyone cheered. The whole crowd cheered me because they didn't see me as the angry brown Muslim guy. They saw me as the fellow British patriot, reminding them of their British values. So I actually got a white conservative crowd to cheer me saying, let's not deport the Al-Qaeda terror suspect. <laughs> Um, you've also had an interview, I'm, I'm thinking about you talking about being in a room full of, of white folks. Your interview with Vivek Ramaswamy. Very much that not a white man. That is also very hard. <laughs> I mean, that, it is equally hard to be a brown man interviewing another brown man, right? How many of you guys have seen that interview? It is a recent viral video of Mehdi's. It was very, very good. Mehdi, I, I mean, I need to know, how long do you spend preparing for this I mean, do you have a team of people working yes. with you? We, we have a room full of a lot of young people as well who might want to be you one day. How do you so do this? So we do a lot of prep. And, I talk, and there's a whole chapter in the book called Do Your Homework, right? Because a lot of people, unfortunately, in our line of work don't do their homework and then wonder why some politician walks all over them or they're not prepared. And even, even brown people in general, a lot of Muslims I've seen lose arguments over the years on whatever issue it is of geopolitics or domestic work. And it's because they're just not prepared. And it breaks my heart when I see people who are on the right side, on the side of morality, truth, justice, lose because they haven't prepared. And something we've always done, you know, I talk about in the book, when I was at Al Jazeera English, we used to even do role plays before interviews. We would have someone pretend to be uh, the guest. I interviewed Danny Ayal on, the former Israeli deputy foreign minister, I remember back in the day. And, you know, I got one of my producers to basically watch everything Danny had ever done. And I even started calling her Danny to her great consternation. And she basically played Danny in meetings. She would be Danny Ayal on. So I was ready for him on the day. And look, with Vivek Ramaswamy, we did our homework. In fact, we did our homework so well that the night before he did an interview with some random far-right podcaster. And, and, so, and there was a big debate at the time about he, he if you don't know, Ra Vivek Ramaswamy is very anti-affirmative action. He's anti-George Soros. He's anti-woke. Um, and yet, when he was at law school, he got a scholarship from the Soros Foundation for the Children of Immigrants. Um, and <laughs> Look, he could just say, I was a kid, I don't believe that anymore. But no, 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 Vivek Ramaswamy doubles down saying, well, I had no money, I had no choice. He had a lot of money. <laughs> so the night before I watched the interview, and I, I, saw, I walked through, I watched him do the defense. So I know that the next day when I ask, he's going to do exactly that. So it's actually very easy when you do prep like that because you're like, all right, I know exactly what he's going to say. Um, he doesn't know what I'm going to say, but I know what he's going to say. And it was wonderful because I talk about bringing receipts in the book. He, poor guy, I do feel a bit bad for him because he was in one of those live, he was in one of those positions where he wasn't on Zoom, it was on one of those old-fashioned camera locations, so he couldn't see me, he could only hear me. Um, and there's a great moment where he does exactly what he said to the podcast. He said, this is all liberal media propaganda. Go look at my tax returns. Go look at my tax returns. And I said, Vivek, I've got your tax returns right here. <laughs> And it's a great, for me, the prop is a great, I say in the book, the best receipt, to have a physical receipt is one of the great things. It's a dream for an interviewer to be saying, I got it in my hand. And you see his eyes narrow, and he's kind of thinking, oh. And he doesn't remember his own salary from that. I was like, you earned 600 grand. No, I didn't. I said, yes, it's right here. It's a great moment for an interviewer because you're like, okay, you just gave it to me on a plate. He's like, go look at my tax returns. And he doesn't expect me because other interviews haven't done it where we've got the tax returns. So that was fun. It was, it was a good interview. I mean, Vivek Ramaswamy is a, is a, is a super confident, fast-talking brown man. Sounds, uh, sounds similar. So I was like, okay, let's do this. You said one thing in there. You said something about how he made it easy. What you do is so hard. You guys, there are hundreds of people on air at the national level between the three networks and the three cable um, you know, institutions in America. And Mehdi, there are, to the best of my count, four Muslim American men on air, three Muslim American women. I mean, talk to us about the challenges. What have you had to face in this role? What are the debates that you've had to have, have to get you to where you are now? Yes, yeah, a great question. So I, you know, I've been on, I've been on air, on screen since 2012. 
Uh, that's when I first started a TV show for Al Jazeera called Head to Head at the Oxford Union. Uh, before that, I was a, a writer and commentator for three years. I did guest punditry bits. And before that, I was behind the scenes as a TV producer uh, and a researcher after I left university. So it's been an interesting journey on both sides of the Atlantic, a lot of the similar issues, both in the UK and in the US. Look, there's multiple issues that I'm sure many people in the audience can identify. I mean, there's the general minority issue where you have to work you know, twice as hard for half as much, right? We all know that. Everyone in this room knows that. There's that issue. Uh, there's a separate issue which we talked about, which is you know, resting angry Muslim, which is you're the angry Muslim guy. There's dealing with that issue. And then, of course, there is the idea that the, that, that, that the, I don't know what you want to call it, the white mainstream media position is the norm, is the benchmark. And therefore, every other position comes with bias. And therefore, the, the, you know, the, the natural position in, in politics or the media is the one we've had for 100, 200 years. This idea that you can have, I saw somebody the other day saying something about, what's the line? They want, you know, something about doing media outlets that don't have bias. They don't exist. There's no such thing as a media outlet that doesn't have bias. Everyone has their own biases. Some are declared, some are undeclared. Uh, some are, are obvious, some are not so obvious. But there's no such thing as no bias. I'm one of these people who's an opinion host, so I put my bias out there. But then I try and be fair. Like, even if I'm debating Vivek Ramaswamy, I want to give him as much time. I want to be clear that he gets a chance to speak. I'm not, I'm not you know, trying to overrule certain viewpoints. Look, the real challenge has been, obviously, covering issues like terrorism, national security, Middle East, b being a Muslim in public life, because it comes with a lot of baggage. There are certain assumptions about Muslims that there aren't about other minority communities. That is just a fact. We all know that. Look at the attacks uh, that, so, you know, that some of us have had in public life. I've, you know, it's, not, it's not the first Gaza war that I've covered where the natural position is, you're a Hamas apologist, you're this, you're that, etc. You know, why? Because I'm a Muslim, or because I went to Al Jazeera, or because I think Palestinians are human beings. Right? That is the, a default attack on those of us who are in public life who are brown, and it's a very easy way to shut down the conversation. Now, thankfully, many of us have fought back against that and got to where we are in public life and pushed back against prejudice and against bias and against uh, the haters. It's not easy, though. It's not, it's not, you don't wake up one day and say, we won, right? It's an ongoing process. Every day is a challenge. Every day you've got new issues to tackle. Every day you're trying to kind of uh, deal with someone's bias or someone's um, you know, accusations. It's tiring. You know, I say to people, there was a time when I used to just evangelize about Muslims getting into the media. I don't do that anymore. I do think we should have more Muslims in the media, but I don't say it's for everyone. I make it very clear, it's not easy. It's very hard. You have to have thick skin. And I, I make this point uh, to non-Muslims, which is we Muslims are not born with thicker skins than everyone else, right? We feel it, just like everyone else. So it's not easy. And, you know, I'm, I'm good at arguing. I like arguing. But that doesn't mean it doesn't get to me. Like, incessant, like, social media is... You know, as much as I enjoy social media, I'm addicted to social media. It is also can be very dispiriting, disillusioning to see all the hate and all the kind of accusations and all the lazy prejudices and bias that other people don't have to go through. And that's the problem, right? And that's why some of us are fighting very loudly to talk about the issues of kind of how do we define impartiality? How do we define neutrality? How do we define fair coverage? Uh, how do we define diversity? What is the value of having diverse hosts on air, having diverse guests on air? To go back to Salam's point about having different voices and not just the same old people from Congress or government or the military. Yeah, you know, that is one of the advantages we have, those of us who've made it in mainstream media, is to have those conversations in good faith with our colleagues. You talk about liking debating. You talk about um, being good at it. Tell us about a time where you've lost a debate that doesn't have to do with your kids. Yeah. Or my <laughs> wife. Um, the, um, that's a good question. So I, I can give you one very easy example. I, I officially lost it. was a formal debate where years ago I was doing a debate about, um, it was during the Eurozone crisis about a decade ago. I don't know if you remember, Greece was under huge kind of uh, financial pressure from the rest of the Eurozone and Germany. And it was a formal debate in London at a group called Intelligence Squared, which is a kind of, uh, it's a kind of upmarket debating society. People have to pay to go watch debates. And I was debating some Germans. I was alongside a Greek economist. And it was a debate about, is Germany to blame for... And I remember I went with... And I, I made all the mistakes that I warned about in the book. I went with a bunch of really good statistics about how Greece is suffering and how Germany is to blame and how the... Euro and it just... It was a thud. And what was interesting was in the crowd, the crowd, even the Greeks in the crowd were pro-Germany and anti-Greece, because they, like, they were like the rich Greek shipping magnates who live in London you know, and have holiday homes. And think, yes, all the Greeks are lazy Greeks, and we should be punished. And one thing I realized that night is that's what... So we haven't talked about it yet. The second chapter in the book is about feelings. The third chapter is about receipts. The first chapter is about the audience. 
And that was one of the lessons I learned that we lost that debate. It's the only debate I've lost at Intelligence Squared. Uh, I never lost a debate after that one. But I learned my lesson, which is play to the crowd. You have to connect with that audience. That audience was a very upmarket, upheeled city of London crowd, people who paid 50 pounds a ticket. They were not the kind of people who kind of arguments about trade unions or unemployment or poverty really appealed to. I had to make a much, I should have made a much different argument that played to their financial and economic interests, that played to their prejudices, if you want to be. And sometimes you have to do that. It's not about being two-faced. It's about identifying what your audience wants and trying to give it to them without obviously betraying your own position or being two-faced. So I, we lost that debate very badly. And I remember coming away thinking, I was mad to think that that crowd was going to buy the arguments I was selling. Talking about that crowd, and by the way, you do talk really fast because I've blown through. I mean, most I, I of my don't know questions. what's happening tonight at the Impact <laughs> Gala, but I've given speeches at events where the sign language person has told me off afterwards. <laughs> so, like, I've made their job impossible. Actually, can I tell a very quick story about that's of in course, the book? When I talk about, when I talk about, so I interviewed Vital. I talk about this in the book. I interviewed Vitali Klitschko, uh, former heavyweight champion of the world. For those of you who are boxing fans, for those of you who've been following the Ukraine war, now mayor of Kiev fighting against the Russian invaders. I interviewed him uh, shortly after the Crimean annexation, before this current war. He came into the studio at Al Jazeera. Man is six foot 10, right? His arms are bigger than my entire body. And he comes in, and at the time he was mayor of Kiev, or running for mayor, and he said, uh, he said, my English not so good, speak slowly. <laughs> That's my Ivan Drago voice from Rocky Four. It's not actually, it's not actually uh, uh, Klitschko. But I was like, okay, so, he starts, the interview starts, and I, was, and, I, and I was like that tourist on holiday who speaks, I was like, do you know? And I was really good, I was really like, can you tell us why? And then as the interview went on, I just forgot and just went back to normal, speaking really fast. And then at the end, I asked him if he's connected to the Ukrainian mafia, which he didn't like. And the interview ends, and he stands up, and he says, you said you would speak slowly! <laughs> and in that moment, in that moment, two thoughts crossed my head. Number one, if he hits me, I will die. But number two, if he hits me, it'll go viral. Die viral. But I talk about it in the book, in the chapter on staying calm. I had to very much stay calm in that moment and wait for my producers to rescue me from the former heavyweight champion. But yes, talking fast can get you into trouble. Well, uh, you, you, you did go pretty fast, but that's great. It's great. It's, it leaves a lot of room for questions. If Sue, if you're okay with it, if we just start and I can, I can inject, you know, interject part way through as well, as well. Um, does anyone want to ask the first question? Yeah. Salam alaikum. First of all, I never thought you were that funny. You're very funny. Should be stand-up comedian. I mean, I'll take that as a compliment. But <laughs> no, it is. It is. Before today, you thought I was some unfunny, no, 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 you're very angry man. No, 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 no. You're very funny. Um, do you think the network are concerned about losing ground to the alternative media, especially with their coverage, especially with the younger generation, the 30s and the 20s and early 40s? Are they concerned or this is not on the table at all? Uh, that's a good question. No, I think all, I mean, if you work for a TV network, you know that ratings are, are what defines a lot of uh, what goes forward. Look, cable news has a much older audience uh, than, and, than, than it used to, and going forward, that's a problem, obviously, in an age where people are cutting the cord. Uh, I remember when I was at Al Jazeera, I asked my team, we were all a very young team in their 20s, how many of you have cable? Zero. None of them had cable. Everyone just watches streaming or watches online. No, it's a real problem, which is why you've seen a lot of media companies uh, move into streaming, uh, try and do things uh, online. Uh, you know, I, I do two shows. I do one show live tomorrow night for the cable channel, and I also do a show for the streaming channel, uh, which is Peacock. So that is NBC's attempt to get into that space, uh, which is a difficult space to get into, right? Because it's, it's, there's a lot of competition and people aren't doing appointment to view television anymore. The days when people sat around the dinner table or, you know, six o'clock news are long gone, uh, both for network and cable. So it's about trying to find the audiences in the space they are. I think there's been a lot of mythologizing about young people and what they want. For example, there was a very, there was an argument for a long time, which is you can only give young people short clips. Young people don't have an attention span. And that's partly true, but it's not fully true. And and uh, Salam very kindly mentioned some of my YouTube videos that have like a million views. Some of the monologues I do on my show go up to 20 minutes, 25 minutes. I did a, I did a debunking of everything Marjorie Taylor Greene's ever said, after which I had to take a shower. But it was, 20, <laughs> it was 25 minutes long. It's had 1.8 million views, I think, on YouTube. So there is an audience for people watching stuff. And we have like stats, guys. I'm sure Zareen does at ABC will tell you, like, what's the engagement rate? Do people watch a 12-minute video for four minutes, six minutes, eight minutes? How many get through to the end? So I, I, first of all, I think it's a bit, you know, insulting to 
see young people to say they only have short attention spans, they're not interested in long form. That's not actually true, right? It depends how you engage with young people, what topics you're covering. But having said that, there is also a cohort of young people who do just want to watch short clips on TikTok. And so, you know, we were one of the first shows to get on TikTok. Uh, so, you know, now the Chinese government can monitor everything I do. But, we, <laughs> but we're on there and we've got, we've got you know, my little show, uh, the Mehdi Hassan show has got, you know, I think we've got like 450,000 followers on TikTok, which is about half as much as the official CNN account does. So our show punches above its weight on TikTok because we deliver clips on topics in a way that the people on TikTok appreciate. So that's not about, it's not about dumbing down your content. A lot of people think you have to dumb down what you're doing. Not at all. The opposite, in fact. I think you've got to engage young people who are super interested on issues like climate change, uh, foreign policy, war, uh, poverty, issues that don't get enough coverage in mainstream media, and actually engage with them on that, whether it's long or short, you'll actually get a receptive audience, because a lot of people feel like, quote unquote, MSM is not catering to the stories, issues, and people that they care about. And another thing we try and do, both for the TV show and for social media, is try and get diverse voices on, to go back to Salam's point again at the beginning. One of the things I've done, one of the, one of the great victories I think I've had, I'm sure Zareen would agree, she's going to do one right now, an interview, interviewing people who wouldn't otherwise get on TV who are forgotten, who aren't known to the bookers, who aren't known to the hosts. And that is why it's so important to have diversity on television. It's so important to have black hosts on air during the George Floyd moment. It's so important to have Muslim hosts on air when Islamophobia is on the rise. It's so important to have Jewish hosts who can talk about anti-Semitism, right? That is why people think, oh, diversity is overrated. No, in media, it's absolutely crucial. Thank you for the plug. It airs at 7 a.m. on Good Morning America tomorrow. <laughs> uh, over there. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Um, I'm over here. Hi, Mehdi. <laughs> My question is, I've obviously we're here at the Impact Convention, and I think for me it's very critical that Impact represents our voices um, out there in the media when they are approached. So what is your advice for Impact in terms of media arguments when they are uh, involved in an argument with some media person? And then who should be speaking for Impact? What type of person? And then who should, and what should they be saying at this time? Well, since we're doing plugs, the person who should speak for Impact is someone who's read my book, obviously, from cover <laughs> to cover. Um, look, I, I can't tell you who's going to speak for Impact. What I can say is for all organizations in this space, uh, groups that are doing lobbying work, civil rights work, pressure groups, advocacy groups, I think one thing that's so important is building relationships, right? I think Zorin can agree, like in our industry, it is very much about who you know, not what you know. It's very much being able to kind of email someone, knock on someone's door, pick up a phone, and have those contacts and be able to have long-standing relationships. So when the excrement hits the fan, there is actually a pre-existing relationship. What I found with Muslim communities, both in the UK and in the US, is that we're very reactive as communities, right? We're very, very, we're, we're good to go when there's a crisis. When bad things are happening, then we're energized, we're on the streets, we're lobbying, we're, we're, you know, we're pressuring media organizers. But in the quote unquote quiet time, in the, in the good times, in the calm times, that's when we get a little complacent, we get a little lazy. And I often say like, we need to be able to build and build resilience and build uh, relationships at a time when maybe not, there's not some sexy issue on the news that's getting everyone worked up. That's the problem. We always come too late to issues. And that's my fundamental critique of a lot of organizations, not just in the Muslim space, uh, but across the civil rights advocacy spaces. Just too reactive, just waiting for something to happen and then starting the petition, the drive, the protest, the lobbying. That doesn't work like that. You need to be able to have the relationships, have the conversations, exercise the influence, make change at a grassroots level, in boardrooms, in newsrooms, at all times, 24-7, 365 days a year, every year. Sorry. Um, so my question is kind of more about like students and on campus uh, and like supporting uh, the Palestinian people. So how do we as people, especially students, uh, talk about Palestine uh, and with all the backlash that can come with, you know, speaking for like the dignity of the Palestinian people in Gaza right now? Well, that's an easy question to deal with. Um, look, again, like with Ember, I can't tell students what to say. What I can say is that in my view, uh, we need to be able to have these conversations and debates in good faith. To go back to what I said before, I would urge people to avoid debates that are in bad faith. There's a lot, you know, in a time like this, there's a lot of opportunity for people to say, all right, let's debate X. 
think about the question, is it worth it? Is that really a debate or are you just really increasing polarization and division and hate? So pick and choose which arguments and debates you actually want to have at a sensitive time like now. And again, to go back to my chapter on feelings and the importance of emotion, there is no point trying to convince people if you cannot reach them here as well as here. Like you can have as many UN resolutions and international law references and the Fourth Geneva Convention and statistics from Human Rights Watch as you like. Right, that doesn't get through to people, especially on an issue like this, where people are so entrenched, people are so emotional, people are so hurt, people make this issue about their identity, right? The hardest argument to win is any identity-based argument, because people are not interested in facts and figures. They feel like they're being attacked at their very core, and it makes people uh, back away, not come forward towards any kind of reasoned middle ground, to go back to Zorin's point about finding common ground. So one thing I would say is, first of all, to all people involved in these debates, like, my biggest critique of politics right now is that we have allowed dehumanization to take over our politics across the board. I'm not going to say both sides or one side, but in general, especially thanks to the toxic effect of social media, that we no longer see other people, even our most fervent opponents, as people with humanity and self-respect and dignity and feelings and hearts. And I think that is what we have to do. You can disagree with someone fervently. You can think they take the worst position in the world. But unless you're engaging with them as a human, there's no point. You're never going to win them over. And if your argument is, well, I don't care about winning them, that's fine. But be honest about that. Be honest that your goal isn't really trying to persuade or change someone. It's trying to dunk on someone. It's trying to score a point. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I do it for a living. Sometimes it's good to dunk on people and score a point. Sometimes it's not, right? Some, depending on where you are. If you are on a college campus and you're getting into a row with friends of yours who until yesterday were good friends of yours, but this issue is now dividing you, try and start. No one's saying not to say your piece. No one's saying not to defend the people you think need defending. But try and find some common ground. I, you know, somebody asked me during the book tour, you know, you, this book came, this, you know, what would you do with this book at Thanksgiving when you're at the table with crazy Uncle Jim, the Trump supporter? How do you get through to them? And I said, it's very simple. If you go to crazy Uncle Jim, the Trump supporter, and say, oh, well, Donald Trump didn't finish building the wall because Mexico didn't pay for it, and actually X percent of immigrants are criminals and 20% get jobs. None of that's going to work on crazy Uncle Jim. What you have to say to crazy Uncle Jim before you even get into a debate about immigration is, hey, Uncle Jim, I'm your nephew or niece. Remember our good times. We love each other. We're on the same page. We want the best for our family and our community. You have to find some common ground starting point before you can even get into the exact issues or debates. So if you're debating with someone on campus who's someone you know, then you need to go out of your way to find if you genuinely want to get through to them. You may not want to. But if you do, I do think you need to find some common ground. You need to think about what will appeal to that person in here, not just in here. What will allow them not to be defensive, not to get angry, not to react in a stubborn way. I think those are the kind of strategies we forgot. And I get it. People are very upset right now for good reason. I totally understand why people are not doing that. But if you're asking me in an ideal world, in a utopian campus, yes, I would like to see students engaging in the humanity of others. Because let's be honest, no matter where you stand on this conflict, this conflict involves innocent human beings on all sides. That needs to be a starting point for any discussion. And we are seeing bigotry on both sides. I'm sorry, I hate the phrase both sides, but in this case, literally I look at my Twitter feed every day and it's anti-Semitic attack, Islamophobic attack, anti-Semitic attack, Islamophobic attack. And it's depressing and demoralizing. And I think these are those times where we, we need to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. We need to be able to say our piece, defend our position, make our case, whatever it is, and also be able to fight against bigotry at the same time. I don't believe those are mutually exclusive goals, and I will never let anyone convince me that those are mutually exclusive goals. I think that was such a great answer. Is there anything that you would have written in your book now, knowing everything you do about this current crisis that we're facing, and this moment of heated debate and argumenting, that you maybe didn't write when you wrote your book? Well, there was a chapter that I wanted to write on how to win an argument on social media that I never got around to. There was going to be like a, a which, which still is always a, a, a difficult one, uh, one I struggle with. But I think, yeah, I think, look, to go back to your point, a lot of people, so when, when the book came out, when the book cover came out, there was immediately some snark on social media. People like, win every argument? Why would you want to win every argument? That's a very arrogant position. Sometimes it's good to lose an argument and learn from losing, which I totally agree with, by the way. But, you know, people, you know, people misinterpret. Win every argument means I'm equipping you with the skills to try and win any argument you're in the place for. It doesn't mean you need to go out and literally pick an argument and win every single one. It's like if I wrote a book called Drive Every Car. It doesn't mean I want you to go out and drive every single car. It means I'm giving you the skills to drive every car. Um, anyway, so my point is, I think 
I would come back, I would probably dwell a bit more on that aspect of the advantage that comes from losing. You, you asked me earlier, like a debate you've lost. I didn't write about that debate I've lost. I probably should have written it. Um, and I think also the humanity, right? Arguments are between who? They're between human beings. And that fundamental insight, it sounds so cliched and obvious and banal, but it's key because we forget that we're going up against humans. I do talk in the book about empathy and the importance of putting yourself in other people's shoes to try and understand where they're coming from in order to I, both beat them in an argument, but also understand why they're saying what they're saying. And I would want to stress a bit more of that because that is what's missing in our discussions. Like, I will have the most ferocious argument with people, but... I will always try and think, where are they coming from? Why are they saying what they're saying? What's the basis for their argument? And I think too many of us forget that. We think, I'm right, everyone else is wrong. How, how could anyone even take that position? Crazy, right? That is not the right way to approach any argument or debate. You have to start with, and I say it in the book, steel manning the, your opponent's argument. Not straw manning it, steel manning it. Coming up with the strongest version of the other side of the case to try and understand, A, your own side of the case, but also, B, are there any weaknesses in that argument? But again, it's about arguing in good faith. Hello, Aslan Komandi. Uh, so I have a question over here. Um, you know, you, you do a lot of topics. How do you pick your guests that are going to come on and argue the either side of the equation? Uh, I mean, it depends on what topic. I mean, I try... Well, first of all, I mean, one thing to go back to what I said earlier, we try for diverse guests. My team and I are very good. Uh, we're very proud of our record. We actually have a spreadsheet. I don't know if I should say this publicly, but I will. We have a spreadsheet where we actually go through and check like, how many women guests have we had, how many non-white guests have we had, because cable news and TV news in general has been white for a very long time, uh, and we white and male. So we go out of our way to try and make sure we don't have quote-unquote manals, uh, just panels of men. Uh, we try and make sure we have non-white guests, you know, especially if we have a three-person panel, there's no excuse to not have a, a woman or a person of color on that panel. If it's two, sometimes you know, the guests... So one thing is diversity. We're very, we're very keen on diversity, and I think it's very important, and I, and I get the feedback from viewers that they appreciate the fact that we try and find people they haven't seen elsewhere. In terms of the debates, look, I want to debate people in good faith. So people say to me, oh, wouldn't you love to debate Marjorie Taylor Greene? I'm like, no. I probably wouldn't do an interview with her if she offered me a million dollars, because what would the point be? It would be an insult to my viewers to bring on someone who's a bad faith actor who doesn't even believe anything they say. I always say when it comes to the right, I prefer the true believers. Right? I prefer the freaks who actually believe the crazy far-right nonsense than the people who are pretending. Right? The people I really can't stand in politics today are all those Republicans who hate Trump secretly but publicly pretend to be MAGA. Those are the people I can't stand. So the people who, you know, I wouldn't do interviews with people who just are wasting everyone's time, shouting or screaming or lying. Uh, those, that's the lessons I've learned over, over kind of 10 years of doing my shows. Uh, so I try and avoid that. But I do try and find who is the best, to go back to the point I just made about steel manning an argument, who is the best advocate of that position? I don't want someone, you know, people think I enjoy like, you know, shooting fish in a bar. Actually, it's, that's, those are boring. Interviews that are really easy are boring. I want an intellectual challenge. I want to be able to show the audience this person really knows their stuff, but let me hold them to account and poke some holes in their argument nevertheless. For me, that is intellectually satisfying. It's also, it's also morally satisfying. It's also truthful, right? You're not just straw manning the other side and getting some, somebody on who's, you know, uh, I, I watched, I don't know if any of you saw this, uh, Wajahat Ali, a good friend of mine, was on Piers Morgan uh, the other day. And um, he was supposed to be on with another guest, whose name I won't say, who's a very strong advocate of the Israeli case. And that guest pulled out and they got another guest in their place, and that guest, whoo, she said some crazy stuff. And I said to Wajad afterwards, I said, you're lucky. Like, you didn't even have to make your argument because she basically discredited her own side. If I was a pro-Israel, I'd be really bad that that was the person defending me on air. So I, 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 I don't like that. I don't like such guests. I want to get someone who's the best defender of the Israelis, the best defender of the Palestinians, the best defender of the Republican Party, the best defender of the Democratic Party, because that makes for intellectually honest and serious television. So again, all goes back to what I've been saying since the beginning, good faith debate and argument, not performative nonsense just for clicks. Yes. 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 Oh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you for being here, Mehdi. I've seen a lot of your videos. I love it. I had a quick question. Um, you talk a lot about bias that's built into the media, built into social media. I'm sure the algorithms that we all yes. read and see. I don't know what your thoughts are on artificial intelligence and potential bias against certain, you know, anti-Zionist, anti-Semitic or anti-Islamophobic type of uh, rhetoric and how we can sort of prepare for that. 
It's a great question. I'm no expert on AI, but I would say that the, the failure so far to come up with some kind of ambitious, transnational, weighty form of regulating AI, or at least examining the potential for AI, is very worrying. I've, I very much worry about the 2024 election and the role that AI will have. I don't know if any of you are following this. In the UK right now, literally this weekend, today, they had the biggest pro-Palestinian march, uh, the biggest march in British history since the Iraq war march that I did in 2003 as a 24-year-old. It's a huge march today. And interestingly, there was a big debate around that march and whether there was going to be violence, whether there's, there was going to be attack on British monuments. Actually, there was violence. It came from far-right neo-Nazis, interestingly enough. Surprise. Um, but to go with the debate around that march, there is a video that went circulating online of Sadiq Khan, the Muslim mayor of London, where he says, yes, go do everything, and says all this crazy stuff. It's obviously not Sadiq Khan. It's an AI generated version of Sadiq Khan. And if you know Sadiq Khan, like Ilhan Omar, like Rashida Tlaib, as a Muslim in public life, he has to have a lot of security. He gets a lot of death threats. You can imagine how this has ratcheted up the level of hate and animosity against Khan. Now, the police are investigating that video in the UK, but that is just, that's the tip of the iceberg. That is what is heading our way in the US next year in terms of how, how are those of us who are media going to be able to identify which videos are real and fake? How are those of you consumers online going to know, is this a real person speaking? Is this an actual politician saying it? There are no guardrails right now, and I, I, this is way above my pay grade or seniority or understanding, but the idea that we would go into an election now without having sufficient public education about the dangers of AI and deep fakes, uh, without media companies having a strategy for this is very worrying. I mean, the fake news online right now, especially in a crisis like now with Gaza, is scary. I see people on the pro-Israel side and the pro-Palestinian side sharing nonsense. I have friends of mine who will send me stuff and say, is this true? And I'll say, no, it's not. Um, and, it's, it's, and the AI will only take that to the next level or the hundredth level. It's very scary. I, I'll speak up a little bit on behalf of ABC News on that point. I know we have layers and layers of people looking to see every yes. single video that's posted on our social yes. or makes it to our air. It goes through so many channels because you can't make one mistake, right? And I know MSNBC and yeah. NBC people does People say well. to me, why haven't you shared that video? I'm like, because it hasn't been verified by our company. Yeah. I mean, there's a higher standard, obviously, than just anyone on social. And obviously, it'll be tested, but yeah. Okay, uh, we only have room for two or three more questions, but I'll try to get over to yeah. that. Yeah. Let's go to uh, Ali Auntie right there. So maybe your thoughts. Um, the Muslim community is so angered right now and preparing to the November 24 election next year. They don't want to vote Democratic. They're angry that they want yeah. to. And so the choice is, and they don't want to vote Republican. To spite our faces, they more, you know, may go that route. What are your thoughts on it? How should we process it? it it's a hard one. We're so divided amongst it's, ourselves. It's a hugely hard question. It's the only question I've been talking about with friends and family and colleagues uh, for the last few weeks. Um, the question was, Muslim community is very angry right now, especially over what's happening in Gaza. Don't want, a lot of Muslims don't want to vote for Joe Biden, but they don't want to vote for Donald Trump either. Uh, uh, you know, what is the reaction to that? What is there a way forward? Look. This is a two-party system, sadly, in this country. I wish it wasn't. I wish we had more choice on the ballot. I think most Americans wish they had more choice. Uh, a lot of Americans tell pollsters they want a third-party candidate. Nobody believes that. Every election Americans say that, uh, and no one, no third-party candidate ever comes anywhere close uh, to even winning electoral college votes, even going back to Ross Perot. Um, there are going to be a bunch of third-party candidates running right now. It looks like RFK Jr. wants to run, Cornel West wants to run, Jill Stein wants to run. Like everyone, I'm sure ten people in this hall might be running by the end of uh, today. So, and even if you're not born in America, Jenk uh, Wieger wants to run for Young Turks. So, it's going to be. It's going to be a crazy election. It was already going to be a crazy election before October the 7th. It was already going to be a close election before October the 7th. Such is the nature of our electoral college. Such is the le level of polarization in this country. You know, people are fighting over a few thousand votes in a bunch of swing states. And look, I, I'm sure the Democrats are not stupid. I'm sure they're looking at the numbers. They're looking at Michigan. Joe Biden won Michigan by 150,000 votes in 2020. There are a quarter of a million Muslim and Arab Americans living in Michigan. There are a lot of young people in Michigan. There are a lot of people of color in Michigan who are upset with Joe Biden, not just over Gaza, but over a range of issues. Um, and I think that is going to be a key question going forward. I mean, it would be a great irony uh, if Muslims in anger at Biden sit out the election and Donald Trump becomes president again. I think, they would, I don't, I think we'd have to invent a word in the English language to describe that, because irony wouldn't be enough. Um, 
I mean, he would, he would certainly be the luckiest man on planet Earth if Donald Trump gets presidency again, thanks to Muslims. That would be very strange. <laughs> strange, a strange equation that I don't think anyone saw coming. We, but we, look, we have to wrap it. I have a really quick question. Yeah. Can you ever remember another moment in history where Muslim Americans could decide an American election? Well, yes, we do have an event, actually. It's 2000 election, where Muslims in Florida all voted in favor of George W. Bush. He won that state by 535 votes. Count them, 535, in a state where I think it was something like 80,000 uh, Muslim voters who voted majority George W. Bush. Uh, so it's happened before. And interestingly, it happened for very similar reasons. Muslims are very upset with Al Gore and Bill Clinton's foreign policy, very upset with Joe Lieberman as a hawkish member of the ticket and his pro-Israel stance. And George W. Bush seemed like he might be fairer on the Middle East. How did that work out uh, for the Muslims of America? I didn't live here at the time, so I can say nothing to do with me. Uh, I didn't take a position on that election. But look, it's happened before. It could happen again. Obviously, there's way more at stake. In 2000, there were lives at stake with George W. Bush and Al Gore. In 2024, American democracy is at stake. I am one of those people that you might want to dismiss as the alarmist. Uh, the guy with the hyperbole. I'm one of those people who says, if Donald Trump wins again, American democracy is effectively done, right? I, I, I've said that for, I said, in 2019, I wrote an article saying, if Donald Trump loses the next election, he will not accept victory and there will be riots. And people said to me, you're crazy. What are you talking about? That's not how it works. You're from England. You don't understand American politics. The Secret Service will march him out the door. He will go quietly. This is all hyperbole. Then January 6th happened. Everyone's like, oh. January 6th is nothing compared to what's coming next year, uh, unfortunately. And I do worry about the future of democracy in this country. I do understand, you know, now, to be honest, to go back to the question, now is not the time for those debates about who you're going to vote for, because right now there's a humanitarian disaster in the Middle East. No one really wants to have that argument, and I get it. People are hurting. People are upset. To go back to my book, like, the feelings are everything, right? There's no point coming on with facts, um, and there are a lot of facts. But... At some point, that conversation is going to have to be had. And there is a lot at stake in 2024. Sure, Gaza is going to be right up there. The Middle East foreign policy is going to be up there. But also the future of democracy is going to be up there. The future of our climate and our planet is going to be up there. There's a lot of big issues uh, on the ballot. And I would hope that the Muslim community um, is a community that understands the importance of so many issues. There are important issues, and I get everyone has their own priorities, and, and so do I. But there are a lot of important issues at stake in the United States and in the world uh, come 2024. Uh, this is a global problem. I just came back from India. It's a problem in India. It's a problem in Europe. It's a problem in multiple countries around the world. Um, and I think we have to be very clear-eyed uh, about what's going to happen next year. And if people say, look, I can't vote for either of them, I respect that. You know, uh, people's own moral choices are very important to me. But at the same time, as I say, I do this stuff for a living, the stuff I see. Just look at today's New York Times. Look at today's New York Times. Donald Trump plans to round up immigrants and put them in camps, according to today's Times reporting. Last week, the Washington Post reported that he plans to use the military to quell any protests. Right now, we're talking about protests against Biden. At least Biden lets you have protests. Donald Trump plans to use the military to quell protests on January 20th, 2025. I think these are all things we have to think about. I'm never going to tell anyone how to vote, but these are all things you have to think about going into next year's election. But right now, I don't think it's a conversation about voting. Right now it's a conversation about how do we stop the humanitarian crisis in the Middle East. Uh, and right now it's also a conversation about this book. So guys, please get it. Uh, maybe you'll be signing it for a little I will, bit as I, well. I'm going to preemptively say my handwriting is awful, so forgive me when I sign your book. In my defense, I'm he a signs speaker. very fast. I'm That's a speaker, why. I do. I sp I'm a speaker, not a writer, but I will in look forward to signing some of you. Right. Thank you guys, everyone, so much. Thank you.